Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time it's another radio meter. This one is the BKF6 distortion meter. And it is in a cosmetic state that looks like it is brand new. Look at that. Shiny and nice and fine. Yeah, okay. I spent a little bit of hot water and a uh, brushy shiny just to see if I could make it really really nice and fine again. So so far so good. So while I was doing a little bit of cleanup, I just barely touched the glass on the meter and look what happened. See, the glass fell down. So this is a classic problem with this glue. It goes old and brittle and just barely touch it and then click the glass fell down yeah that's what happened so now I need to open and fix the meter before we can proceed with this um, distortion meter but what I can show you um, yeah, we can talk a little bit about how this works so of course you need to have the right input range so it goes yeah from millivolts uh, and all that kind of stuff and then the idea is that you adjust for the frequency you want you have times 1 10 or 100 of this is cycles per second so that will be 110 so this is 1 kilohertz kind of like this there's a mechanical coupling here like a little clutch see click and then fine tune isn't that cute? So the idea is you go into set level and then you adjust the level. Here is the level. Set level. Says the meter right there. And then you can go down into the distortion readouts and then the meter will show you what is your um, distortion. And of course you have to have the frequency correct and hit exactly that spot and then it will notch out the frequency the fundamental frequency you input and then it will display the content of anything else that is of course your distortion uh, relative to your input level so yeah let's open and have a look inside it's actually quite heavy and before we dig into a lot of internal details here i want to uh, oh yeah we've got some selenium rectifiers lovely circuit boards and all that kind of stuff and uh, yes um, it's of course tube based got a few tubes there it's probably also some inside this uh, filter box we got a couple more tubes down there and then the meter here is a little bit funny what we got three wires for the meter why is that that is weird but now i got the colors for the meter and i will try and get the whole meter out and then i will fix the meter first of all and then we can play with the rest so far so good i was able to get the meter out and uh I think I figured out the black wire here. The three wires to the meter, right? So that black one goes down here and it's actually connected to chassis. I just did a little ohm checker. So it's just a kind of shield. And it's because we have a big open hole here with parts connected to electronics. And you can imagine if you have hum, noise or stuff in your circuits you know we have it can handle 0.3 percent at full range so you have a setup here that emits all sorts of harmonics you don't want any of this to go in here couple to the meter and get in here coupled into amplifiers and filters and detectors and stuff like that and create a bad readout so i think that is why they did this a little bit over the top i would say but there well well so now we'll try and uh, fix the meter. 
And again, we got a serial number. And I think here you will see how many microamps and millivolts or whatever it is handwritten here. And this is a classic meter for 1950s, 1960s. When the meter is out, we can see this little date, 64. So this is the version of the silk screen uh, of this unit. So I think definitely this is 1964. Sometimes uh, these meters, they're just totally stuck. And there's no way you can pull out the meter from the frame or the case here, right? The front. So see this, those tiny little screws, they're so short, you can't really use them for any trick. So here I found another screw that's a little bit bigger. So this sticks up a little bit. So here's my little secret trick how to how to solve this. See if I take down that screw like that, right? See what I can do. See, and then I push down the screw and now it's getting up. So that is uh, how I plan to do this. Now I'll find a bigger, a little bit longer screw. And then I think oh, I'm probably, no, it's still extremely stuck and if I really pull hard like this and I hold it and it's gonna say snippity snip and then I'm gonna get glass and parts all over the place and I'm also going to probably break the meter or even bend this little thing that goes into um, the trimming of the meter so I, I really want to lift it up as careful as possible I just found a screw that's a little bit longer I think yeah see that was the trick. Easy, easy. And I didn't break anything. And here's my loose glass now in here. And we can have a look at the meter itself. Is this in a good shape? Yeah, that looks fine. The needle is at a perfect height. And see, here's another little thing I want you to see. See this one. Let me see if I hold this at the exact right angle. You can, oh, yeah, here you can see it. Can you see? The metal is a little bit up here. And this is a classic problem. So if the metal here is bent up this way, it's gonna touch the needle, but there's plenty of space here. And it seems like it's also bent a little bit down. So when these screws here are tightened a little bit too much, see what happens? It bends up here. And it's actually quite a lot this happened here. So this was not assembled correctly. And that is something I really like to fix. It's probably because these um, standoffs down there they are a little bit too short, so when you tighten these two screws, you cause bend to the scale. How stupid is that? Yeah, it's, oh, here it's a lot. See? Hmm, not good. I think I've been gluing glass into Bakelite using silicone, contact glue, all sorts of glues actually over my time. This time I tried with UV curing a resin and a glue. And I mean, if you put in the right amount down here, the glass also went all the way. Look how beautiful that looks. The glue is just perfect up here. The glass couldn't go all the way down, so I had to put in a little bit extra glue. But it just, I can see up here that it sucks all the way in. And uh, here it cures in a little bit thicker layer. But it is really, really easy to work with. What a good thing. I'm never going back. So let's continue our little visual inspection around we are now at the back or bottom side input attenuator and i think the 65 and then the 
version of this board explains the day, uh, the year, right? So the input attenuator, what we see here, that will be the different switches. And then we got some arms connecting to the front here. So there's plenty of distance. I think this is the input signal. So um, after the input attenuator, we also got, uh, this is the voltmeter amplifier. And we got two uh, tubes here doing the um, different stages of amplification. But there's a little bit of funny thing here. Look at that shield, a little copper sheet. And look at the ground. Here is, I think this is the ground or something like that, right? Look at that. There's a slot in that. And then it goes like this. So <laughs> they are afraid of some sort of coupling. So they want to guide signals down here and not hear the sensitive inputs. They don't want to share the path of current. <laughs> that is some funny, funny way to solve it. And this is, of course, the different um, distortion levels we select here. Oh yeah, look at that track. So this is, uh, of course, the high voltage and the high voltage track sucks up dust. So I have to clean this a little bit. Probably not using my fingers. What is that a little solder thingy? Yeah, and you can see the heat from the tubes change, uh, affect the color of the circuit boards. So now we are at the back. Oh yeah, by the way, my model here is called BKF6BC. So um, I went to peel.dk to get schematics and he don't have exactly this model. Um, so I think mine is a little bit older. Uh, I think this one is from 65 and his model is from 67 or 68 or something like that. So definitely every year they improved or optimized or changed something. And then you'll have the letters going up, up, up all the way. So here's the selective amplifier board and again we got two tubes uh, on that board and it's of course full of capacitors down here a little bit of modifications uh, capacitors for the power supply and the old style mains and selenium rectifiers mm, I'm not super happy about those but that's just how it is well, look at those capacitors here. Ooh, one leaked and the other one is swollen a little bit. So, yeah, I expect these to be failing. So it's, this is low voltage stuff, right? And this is the high voltage. So, yeah. And here is the selective amplifier. Well, it's selective notch amplifier. So you select the frequency. It's not amplifying. <laughs> that is how it works. But they call it selective amplifier. But it's obviously the same, right? And uh, there isn't any tubes in here. It's just uh, the ranges. You put in different capacitors and resistors and all that kind of stuff down here. Plenty of trimmers to handle all that alignment. And a nice variable capacitor here. I kind of like this mechanical coupling here. I don't know why you want to take it away. Ah, it goes a lot more smooth. You can still move it, but I guess that is not the whole idea about that. <laughs> and the whole the hole here is so you can pull the tube and so the tip, there's room for the tip, isn't that nice? And then the the hole here is you put it out and then you can somehow tweak the tube in. 
<laughs> oh, I love it. Here's what I did. I took out those two mysterious red capacitors. And that is the filament voltage. I twisted the wires for the filament because that is where the highest current goes. And as you see here, the AC goes into a selenium rectifier. And this is quite typical. We get uh, three connectors out. So the center one is positive and then the other two that will be negative. Negative goes directly to the capacitor here. And the red wire goes via this variable resistor. So this is where you find adjust the voltage for your filament supply. And then after the resistor, it goes to the capacitor. So this resistor is also a filter, uh, sort of a filter uh, resistor. It decreases the peak currents as well. So this is a nice way to filter. This is a much better position for the resistor instead of having it on the outside of the capacitor, the output side to the filaments, definitely on the input side. Um, this way you get less ripple in your wires and less uh, magnetic radiation from the wires. Um, the filament voltage then goes from this capacitor via the, funny enough, I mean, look at the brown cable here is the brown wire is the positive filament and then there's also a brown wire that is ground here and ground to the other one and then the return path of filaments that's the wide wire that goes to the other capacitor here I yet i haven't figured out what the other capacitor is doing i don't have exactly the right schematic here and another fun thing about this uh, power supply that is um, all the wires, they go through this hole. And on the other side, all the wires, they are soldered to all those terminals here. And then new wires are soldered to this side. And then they go through this hole. And then they go down here and into the more or less entire circuit. So filament wires goes here. I mark the two tracks here and to one of the tubes, series, to the other tubes, series, and back again. And then to the next board, and to the next board, and so on. So all tubes, filaments, they are in series. And that, that is uh, because they are the same voltage, the same current, and that is uh, how it works. So they get exactly the same voltage across them. Um, high voltage uh, supply, again, selenium rectifier and um, here again the positive goes to the other resistor for fine adjustment of the high voltage and then it goes to the first capacitor here's the green wire input and then a resistor to the next part of the capacitor we've got two capacitors in this one and then a filter resistor capacitor another resistor another capacitor and here is a, a ground wire separate ground wires that goes all the way to that circuit board so we don't share ripple current with the different capacitors oh no they're different wires from different capacitors that goes all the way to the circuit that is definitely how you want to do it uh, most optimal so we've got three different high voltages they get more and more and more filtered depending where in the circuit the high voltage is used so that will be the red capacitors and you can see one is really swollen and the other one leaked and uh, so i tried to measure them and uh, this one says uh, they're both exactly the same right so uh, 1000 microfarad and it's 20 to 30 volts and uh, of course, depending on the frequency, here it is uh, 88. Oh, this is my fault. Let's just go all the way down to, I think we should um, definitely go to 100 hertz because that is a fair uh, frequency to, uh, to measure because we are actually using 
the capacitor at 100 hertz because of the bridge rectifier, right? And it's supposed to be 1000 and this is actually 10% um, too much. But look at the internal resistance 0.3. Here is a modern worse version of the same value capacitor, see? 1035 volts. That's a lot smaller. And the fun thing is, if I take this off, up and it, it feels like it's hollow. There's no weight to this one. I mean, they weigh the same. Isn't that funny? <laughs> so maybe all the juices or stuff, stuff like that evaporated or whatever it did. But anyway, let's look under the same conditions. Oh, we have a little bit less um, on the microfarads, but look at the internal resistance at 100 hertz. And of course, if you go up in frequency, you will see a lot less um, serious resistance, obviously. And that is one of the uh, cool thing about instruments like this. You can connect them to a PC, you can do all sorts of uh, sweeps and compare your components when you're repairing stuff. Here's a piece of software uh, one of my buddies made for uh, this instrument. And all I have to do is just uh, hit start and then it will uh, connect to the instrument and it will uh, manipulate the different frequencies and uh, transfer all the measurements more or less uh, as we speak here. And when we're done with the measurements, I can of course save a CSV file and I can load this CSV file into uh, any program and do all sorts of uh, compare and what not. So here is uh, of course the internal resistance, the red one, and then the capacitance that goes like that. And this is for the blue a new capacitor. And if we um, load both, uh, both the new and the old capacitor into uh, Excel, for example, and then compare the two uh, curves into the same uh, little curve like that, right? So here is internal resistance of the new, much lower, and that's at the high internal resistance of the old one. I made the curve red because the capacitor was red and the other one is blue, just to make it uh, very visible. And again, we saw the red capacitor was actually a little bit higher uh, in reading when um, frequency was very low. And then at higher and higher frequency, the capacitance gets down, where our new one stays good and healthy. So uh, that is more or less uh, what to say about the capacitors. And of course, if you check out the swollen one, and we also do a little compare or a little measurement on that one, it's very fast to see that this one is completely dried out or something like that. There's nothing left of uh, goodies inside that one. Oh yeah, by the way, see the big difference in size? I of course want to mount these. So how do we do that? Yeah, I measured the diameter of this one and that one, and then I made a little 3D design, and I just 3D printed two of these. <laughs> this takes like a few minutes, and then we have a little tool for uh, mounting. See, and uh, when you push these, see, it can, it's a little bit elastic because of this design that I made here. So I think this is a pretty neat way to uh, hold capacitors, so I can still reuse the uh, mounting method in the unit. Don't you think this is a pretty neat repair? It even looks good. <laughs> Let's see if it works as well, right? Yeah, I had to remove one little wire here to be able to pull out half of the power supply. But I think uh, that is all I need because I needed to access the screws here and uh, yeah I think oh, yeah there was also a wire here to desolder from that point so now let's assemble and try this thing oh, yeah, did you see I also twisted both of the wires here it's I really like twisted wires from the two and four uh, transformers and all the AC and all that rectifier stuff 
very good advice uh, if you play with tube stuff and especially uh, audio tube stuff stuff where you really can hear even the weakest kind of hum stuff like that. I'm actually really excited now for the first uh, power up. I spent so much time making this nice and shiny. So what did I do here? Set ah set level and then. So this is the voltmeter. I am a little bit confused because voltmeter goes in volts or millivolts, right? And then here we got the 300 millivolts or 300 volts, depending on this. So if I hit set level, this gets out. So how many millivolts to input now? Hmm, that is confusing. Why is it doing this? How can I... I mean, I think we are now in millivolts, right? So what I've done is I put my uh, sine wave generator for one kilo hertz, put everything here in the middle, turn this on. My sine wave uh, generator is off. And uh, what are we waiting for? Let me dial up the voltage nice and slowly. And I'm looking, of course, constantly on power usage and we don't see anything bad or nasty. Let's be quiet here. So this is 200. Oh, did you see that one? So let's go for 220. Yeah, this is 220 volts and it's using 30 watts. And this is very close to what I expected. And also this little meter go up and down. That's definitely also. No, there's no sounds or anything. Good. So we are in set level. Fantastic. And we are, of course, flat. I think this is how it's supposed to be. So let's turn on the light again. Okay, so let's crank up. Oop. I don't see anything. So that is one kilohertz. Why don't we see anything? What am I doing wrong here? Ooh. We got a little bit. Okay, so, so this, so here we got a problem. This one is. Hmm. So this is 200 millivolts in. Why am I not? So this is my meter. So 200 millivolts. Okay, so that is a good sign, I suppose. Let me turn off the input, yeah. <laughs> I need to get this stuff. It is not working. Okay, so at least this works. So this is volts and this is millivolts, okay? And 300 is here, but if I turn it on and off, so there's definitely some kind of stuff that is not working. And I really am super sad that I don't have the correct schematics. Let me try and see if we can go. Nope, response. For the filters, I was hoping to see. Something here. Well, well. Set level. Nothing works. Ah, oh, damn it. And we got breaking news. Of course it is working. But there's something with the 
input attenuator here. I think I'm doing something wrong, but anyway, it is of course in volts when it's doing the, um, the measurements. So that here is 0 0.3 volts. So I just didn't know uh, because I don't have the manual for the exact this version. So I got now 200 millivolts RMS input. All right, we are here and I've adjusted this for one kilohertz and let's go to set level. So here's the thing. Let's adjust the level for the set level indication. And let me crank it to like 30% whatever right see if i dial the frequency ooh it gets bad and then ooh it gets bad so it's all about finding oopsie doopsie the super duper good good spot and then you go down so that's 10 percent. so five is okay so it's like here right so that is 10 where are is 10 okay so this is five percent distortion and uh, my generator here is a less than one so I, I think this one reads a little bit too much and I also have an explanation for that let me show you um, now I'll just take off my input look at that see there's noise and what kind of noise is that we can actually use the instrument to debug that by just going into the frequency range of times one. Oops, and then dial the frequency down to 50 hertz. 100 hertz is here, oh, not a lot. Let's go down to 50 hertz. Ooh, yo, 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 yo. See? I bet this scale is a little bit off down here in the low range. And I bet this is 50 hertz. So here is all your noise, and this is of course affecting my measurement, and that is of course because some of the capacitors in the high voltage is just as dead as the one ones in the filament. So I'm not completely done yet, so I have to change these as well. But at least I know the unit works, it just measures a little bit too much due to the ripple on the anode supply. So, that is actually what I wanted to show you guys, uh, this fantastic old radio meter unit. I hope you had a little bit of fun, so uh, see you around. Bye bye.